Parker Crane was born on May 19, 1920 in Hollister, California, as the son of Michelle Crane and his father, whose name is unknown. The father was the one to bestow him with the name Parker, a boy's name, which his mother resented for some reason. If you can't tell, Michelle was completely psychotic and abusive as a mother, and by the time that Parker was seven years old, the father was seemingly no longer in the picture as far as we can tell. I'm guessing Michelle either took his life or her absolute lunacy scared him away, leaving young Parker alone with his abuser. The two moved to Los Angeles, where Michelle decorated his room into a girl's room, complete with flowery wallpaper, dolls, and like seven wooden horses. She also forced him to wear girl's clothing and go around with a wig, insisting that he go by the name of Marilyn. On one occasion, when he drew his mom this picture and signed his name as Parker, she screamed at him and slapped the shit out of him before going on an unhinged tirade. His Marilyn. After threatening him into accepting this, she didn't stop there. She forced Parker to do horrible things to others for no apparent reason other than having it out for the world. If she sees you, she'll make me kill you. Whether Michelle lived on and continued to abuse him or not, the homicidal tendencies and cross-dressing stayed with Parker into his elder years, when he inherited the house and used it as a base of operations as he transformed into a full-blown serial killer. To learn how Parker's childhood abuse carried over into the afterlife, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Horror History. The Bride in Black started as a minor character in the first Insidious, but people were so creeped out by him that he gained an expanded role in the franchise as the main rival of the hero, Elise Rainier. The idea for the bride to be a man was there from the beginning. He's played by Philip Friedman in the original, and then Tom Fitzpatrick takes over the role in Insidious Chapter 2 and 3. The choice was explained by the creative team in the Blu-ray bonus features. The old woman in the film is actually played by a man, which is something that James just thought would be a macabre touch. When people asked him what, why, he said it's just creepy. It's just disturbing, because there's something not right. So when Insidious Chapter 2 was conceptualized, director James Wan and screenwriter Lee Winnell decided to expand the lore of this character who chilled audiences. But to understand what made The Bride in Black stick with audiences, even after watching the film, we've got to take it back to his criminal career as a kidnapper. It's likely that Parker kept a relatively low profile throughout most of his adult years, because the articles about The Bride in Black all seem to refer to Parker as an old woman. It would appear that he is older when his mother started forcing him to kill. I should note that it's not clear if Michelle herself was now an old woman, manipulating him into doing these things, or if she died and her ghost was the one forcing Parker's hand. It seems like when a person dies, their spirit resembles what they look like at death. Michelle appears to be in her mid-30s as a ghost, so I think she died when Parker was young and continued to haunt him from the other side. However, there's no linear time in the further, and those who enter the further can see various incarnations of people who have not yet died. For example, Josh talks to a younger version of himself at one point, but it's not really important if Michelle was dead or alive when Parker started committing his crimes. As his nickname implies, Parker would dress up in a black wedding dress and veil, put on makeup like an old woman, and kidnap exclusively females, which was probably to satisfy his mother, who had always wanted a girl. After capturing them, he would tie them up and choose from an array of tools which were used to finish the women off. Each of them was stored in the house in a secret room behind a bookcase. The newspapers would eventually report that he had 15 victims, but it's possible that there were more that the media just doesn't know about, because he always kidnapped his victims before killing them. Some of his victims seem to be located in and around Newark, California, which is in the Bay Area, only 65 miles from his birthplace of Hollister. However, Parker still lives in his childhood home in LA. He clipped newspaper articles about each of the women that he attempted to abduct, including one girl who got away and described her attacker to police. Maybe Parker was able to get such a high kill count because nobody suspects an old woman of being a serial kidnapper, unless given a reason. Eventually, simply dressing in women's clothing was not enough to satisfy his mother, and she forced Parker to attempt to castrate himself, which landed him in the hospital. He was admitted to Our Lady of the Angels Hospital on September 20th, 1986 at 3.05 a.m. There, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and self-mutilation. One day, as he was being tended to by medical staff, Josh Lambert, the son of one of the nurses, wandered into his room, and seeing the boy sent Parker into a fit of rage. He attacked Josh because he was so jealous of his youth. He wanted his childhood back, and this incident sent Parker over the edge. 
change, literally. Two days later, he jumped to his death, likely joining his mom in the further. His house is left abandoned and the bodies of the victims are not discovered for many years. A day after he passed away, he got into an elevator with Lorraine Lambert, Josh's mother, who doesn't realize that she's apologizing to a ghost. Personally, I think he was following her because he was not done inflicting terror on a Josh or the Lambert family. Josh began experiencing awful night terrors and fits of fear, claiming that an old woman would come visit him at night. Lorraine dismissed his claims until she started to notice a mysterious figure in the background of Josh's photographs. At first, it appeared to be a camera malfunction, but over time, it became clear that there was a dark, bride-like entity creeping closer and closer to Josh with each photograph that he appears in. Eventually, the bride could be seen reaching out for Josh. This is because Josh is what's known as a traveler. He had the ability to astral project, and when he did this, his body was left open as a vessel. But the process for a spirit to possess a living person's body takes time, which is required for the spirit to essentially get in sync with a new vessel. Parker wanted to feel life again. He would later describe life as his happy moment in the sun, as opposed to the cold, dark afterlife in the further. He also wanted to target Josh, because taking over his body would allow him to experience a normal boyhood. However, Lorraine becomes concerned by the photographs and hires psychic medium Elise Rainier to investigate the source of the haunting. As you can imagine, this deeply upset Parker, and he would try to ward off the woman who was trying to cut him off from his best chance at experiencing life again. And Josh guides Elise to the so-called woman who had been visiting his so-called dreams, and Parker lashes out, leaving a pretty nasty slash on Elise's arm. I saw what haunts you, and it's not a friend. It's a parasite. Because of that little altercation, Elise hypnotizes Josh to suppress his memories and make him forget his ability to astral project, seemingly forever. But this action would not go without consequence, as Parker turned all of his attention to getting revenge on the woman who took away his best shot at life. Have you ever been thirsty but didn't want to spend as much as $5 on a bottle of water? We've all been there, so I was excited to team up with this video's sponsor, Tap Water. Tap water is the leading provider for water that is pumped directly into your home. Just turn on the faucet and you've got clean, refreshing water almost instantly. Other brands sell their water in those annoying plastic bottles, which are terrible for the environment. Tap water was engineered to fit a variety of containers, such as a glass, a 2016 World Series cup, or your own reusable bottle. All of our tap water is sourced environmentally, so you can be sure you're not getting that knockoff water brewed in a Chinese hydrogen lab. Tap water is infused with important minerals like calcium, magnesium, and sodium. It's the best way to support bone health and your electrolyte balance. Other brands will charge as much as 30 times more for their product, but with tap water, you can be sure that you're getting the best deal. So don't wait. Get started with tap water today. Make sure to use the code CZ's World when purchasing tap water so they know that we sent you. You can just say it out loud whenever you turn on the faucet. Available now at your local sink, hose, or shower head. Tap water. Is it a good stuff? The Bride in Black had his sights set on Elise. However, there was an issue. Although Elise has the ability to astral project, she knows the dangers of going into the further, so she rarely ever uses it. Despite this, Parker stayed with Elise for 20 years, waiting for his moment to get revenge on her. In 2006, he would get his opportunity when Elise's husband, Jack, passed away. The official ruling was that Jack had taken his own life. Elise states that Jack had suffered from depression before, but she never thought he would go this far. Could it be that Parker was the one to take Jack's life in order to lure Elise into the further? I don't know, but I do know that's exactly what Elise does. So I tried to contact him. I just couldn't help it. I visited the dark looking for him, something I'd never done before, something we living people are not supposed to do. But someone followed me back, a woman an entity driven by evil. As you can probably guess, this was no woman at all. It was Parker Crane. Ever since then, whenever I use my ability, this woman, I could hear her in my head screaming over and over that she's going to kill me. I think, no, I know if I continue with this work, she's going to kill me. And so Elise retired. But like Tom Brady, she couldn't stay away from her calling for long. It's about 2007 when Quinn Brenner shows up at Elise's door asking for help. I'm basing that on the fact that Insidious Chapter 3 takes place a few years before the first film and the fact that Quinn has a T-Mobile sidekick 3. Quinn was trying to connect with her mother when she was intercepted by a demon known as the man who can't breathe, so Elise gathers the courage to go into the further to investigate. Oh! 
As Parker pins her to the armchair and strangles her, her airways start to close in the real world as well. She's only just able to break free and escape the illusory realm. When she snaps back to reality, she tells Quinn that her otherworldly stalker was waiting for her and that she wouldn't be able to help. That's her. She says, one day, eventually, I'm going to die by her hand. And I believe her. And the bride is not wrong, but Elise's time in the sun would not come to a close quite yet. After some encouragement from a colleague, Elise goes back to the further to try to rescue Quinn, who has now been possessed by the man who can't breathe. After delving back into the further and spotting a man resembling her late husband, the bride in black springs out of the dark to attack her, pinning her up against a wall where we hear him speak for the first time. This is how you die. Not today, it isn't. Elise uses some kind of YouTube women self-defense technique to break free and throw the bride out into the dark. They square up, and when Elise challenges him, he slinks back into the darkness, defeated for now. At some point after this, I believe the bride unsuccessfully attacked Elise again, because when we see her sightings book in 2010, there's a picture of the bride, and it's after the page where she wrote Quinn Brenner's name, implying that this was another battle that she fought after saving Quinn. The Quinn Brenner case introduced Elise to Specs and Tucker, who she came out of retirement to go into the ghost hunting business with. So it makes sense that she would have another encounter with Parker. 2010 is also the year that Elise and Parker would have their final confrontation. It's seems like Elise knows she's putting herself in danger every time she goes into the further, so she decides to only use the abilities that she can access from the real world, making it nearly impossible for the bride to harm her. But her work would lead both of them back to someone from their past, Josh Lambert, the very same boy that Parker had tried to possess in 1986. This time, Josh's son, Dalton, has been coaxed into the dark realm. You would think Parker would just go after him, because possessing Dalton would allow him to have a childhood again. I think the reason he doesn't attempt to do this is because there is another, more powerful entity known as the Red Face Demon, who is much closer to possessing Dalton, so it would be futile for Parker to try to beat him. Instead, he just waits in the further for the inevitable to happen. Josh Lambert regains his childhood memories and ventures into the further to rescue his son. He's successful at retrieving Dalton, however, I guess astral projecting for a long period of time after 24 years without practice can be exhausting. And Josh has to stop and rest for a moment as Dalton continues onto his body. The bride waits in this strange area of the further. On Josh's side, it appears to be a window, but on Parker's side, it's like a bathroom. Parker holds up a candle to get Josh's attention, as he had many years ago, causing Josh to take notice and confront him, telling him to stay away from his family. This, however, was only a distraction to keep Josh away from his body long enough for the evil spirit to go back to Josh's body and possess it, trapping Josh's spirit inside of the further, where he sees the illusion of the bride in black fade away into the darkness. After finally claiming a new vessel in the world of the living, Parker tries to blend in by pretending to be normal, which may be enough to fool Josh's wife, but Elise can see things that she cannot, and snaps a photo of him to see what really came back from the land of the dead. Having been discovered, Parker Josh loses it and choke slams Elise into an armchair, just as he had in the further three years prior, but this time she doesn't have the odd physics of an alternate world to rely on. It's a strong 32-year-old man versus an old woman, and Parker keeps his promise. This is how she dies. Josh's wife, Renee Lambert, soon finds the picture of the bride and looks back at Josh as if he killed Elise. However, there's no proof that he did, and there wouldn't be much point in Parker getting into a living body, only to risk spending his new life in jail because he got caught killing someone. So he allows Renee to live. So Parker plays the part of Josh Lambert as the family relocates to Grandma's house while the police investigate theirs. They wouldn't find anything because apparently it was Parker's hands that killed Elise, not Josh's. I'm not entirely sure how that works to be honest, but that's what the movie seems to imply. Renee tells Parker Josh that she's seen more paranormal activity and it's happening again, but he brushes it off and tells her the story that something evil followed him out of the further to get Elise, but that it was over now. Parker's new lease on life may get him out of the depressing realm that he'd been living in, but he's still not able to escape from his mother, whose ghost continues to haunt him and by extension, the Lambert family. However, Parker Josh insists that there's nobody there and implies that even if there was, it would be best for the family's sanity to just ignore it. Late that evening, Parker Josh tries to tell Michelle that she has to go away, which Dalton wakes up and overhears, leading him to suspect that there's something wrong with his daddy. The next day, that is confirmed when he offers to take the boys to school. I'm gonna take the boys to school. You should rest. If you've seen the first Insidious, you know Josh never has time to take the boys to school. He's always running late for work. That afternoon, he would come home to find his mother had already taken the first shot at his new family. Parker Josh comes home that afternoon to find Renee passed out on the sitting room floor and probably realizes that his mother had something to do with it. That is Parker's mother, Michelle. He creepily smells her hair while she's out, just a sign that it had been so long since he'd been able to experience these simple pleasures that the living get to experience, like the scent of shampoo. 
However, he quickly realizes that his supposedly healthy human body is dying when he removes a tooth and catches himself looking pretty rough in the mirror. He's not ready to give up his time in the sun so soon, and Michelle explains his condition by saying that his dead soul is killing Josh's living skin, telling him that the only way to stop wasting away is to kill Renee. It's hard to say if she's telling the truth, seeing as how Parker's mom always encouraged him to kill from the beginning. Maybe she's just making that up because she's crazy, and the real reason Parker's soul is rotting Josh's body is because he possessed it too quickly. For example, when Redface tries to possess Dalton, it's a process that happens over the course of a few months, whereas the Bride in Black gains entry to Josh's body in a single evening. When Renee wakes up, she's worried about the baby, but Parker Josh insists that everything is fine and she's asleep in her room. However, Renee is not calming down because she's seeing ghosts everywhere, almost like they're already dead. No, it's not. This is nothing like being dead, I know. But then he catches himself and adds that he's been to the further and he's seen where these things exist. That's why he knows what being dead is like. Okay, Josh, we totally believe you. He claims that if she ignores the specters, they will go away, which is clearly not true. But before Renee even has the energy to object, they hear the piano playing downstairs. Parker probably realizes that it's the real Josh who is trapped in the further trying to get Renee's attention. However, he does not recognize the tune as the song that Renee wrote for her husband, which makes him look even more sus, and he tries to deflect her attention. Well, it's not the song that we should be worried about. There's somebody in this house. Didn't you just tell her not to worry about that like two minutes ago? Renee ends up going back upstairs to deal with Dalton's night terror, so Parker Josh stays back and tries to send a message to the real Josh telling him that he won't be able to reach her and that the shadows are his home now. I'm not sure what the baseball bat is for. Can you even fight a displaced spirit with a baseball bat? I guess Parker would probably know better than I would. His physical deterioration continues the next day. He stays home, claiming he's not feeling well, but wakes up to see Renee and Lorraine leaving without him and later finds a note claiming that they went shopping. Just then, he gets a knock on his door from Carl. Carl was friends with Elise, and he actually helped her suppress Josh's memory back in 1986. So although he claims that he doesn't remember him, it's possible that Parker does remember, and still has it out for Carl all these years later. Or maybe he just knows what he's up to. Parker Josh invites him in, and after going to the kitchen to get drinks, he returns with a knife behind his back. He's smiling, but his smile disappears when he realizes that Carl knows who he really is. What is Parker Crane holding behind his back? He attacks. The knife is dropped in the scuffle, but before Carl can jab Josh's body with a sedative, he finds himself in a chokehold. Specs and Tucker rush in to save Carl, but Parker easily knocks out Specs, and then somehow, after taking a taser to the back from Tucker, still manages to jam the sedative needle into the big guy's leg. As usual, in a James Wan movie, it takes effect almost immediately, and he collapses right onto Specs. Michelle speaks to him again, once again claiming that he'll need to kill others if he wants to stay alive, but he clearly doesn't want to do that, and screams at her to get out of his head. I almost think that he kind of wants to just take over Josh's life so he can finally live out the normal existence that he never got during his own lifetime. But now that his secret's out, considering Carl knows who he really is, and other people probably do as well, he panics and doesn't know how to proceed. It would appear he has no other option but to give in to Michelle's demands and kill his wife. I'd surmise that the only reason he doesn't kill one of the three unconscious victims in the house instead is because Michelle only wants him to take female victims, just like the 15 female casualties that he took as the Bride in Black. This could be considered additional proof that Michelle was lying about killing in order to stop his body from rotting. So Parker Josh is probably the one to text Lorraine using Spex's phone and tell the two women to come back to the house where he waits to ambush them. Here's another question. How did Parker Crane learn to use a cell phone when he originally died in 1986? I'd have to assume he just learned from observation while being a ghost in the human world. When Lorraine and Renee get back, Parker Josh charges them and they barricade themselves in the room with the piano. Josh's hand is caught in the door, causing him to yell out and claim that although it hurts, he's missed feeling real pain. But not as much as he misses inflicting it on others. Did the taser not count as real pain then? This is kind of a 180 for him. Just earlier that day, he was pleading not to have to kill, but now he claims that he misses inflicting pain on others. My take is that Parker has developed sort of an addiction for homicide. We've talked about this for other villains covered on horror history who have a lot of victims. One example example is Jigsaw. He starts off with the intention of punishing those who have wronged him, but later on he just can't stop killing, so he invents excuses to capture more and more people. So I think feeling pain essentially triggered that part of him and made him remember the feeling that he gets from torturing women. This could also explain what happens next. After he forces his way into the piano room, Renee flees the kitchen and beats him down with a pot somehow, but then he ends up whipping a tea kettle in her direction which knocks her to the floor. As she crawls away, he explains that he never wanted to kill her. She wanted me to kill you. But I said no. But now, I know she was right. He feels that she deserves to die because she's ungrateful for not appreciating her life. Which is a hell of a claim for someone who once killed himself, but I guess hypocrisy is not this guy's biggest problem. 
The possessed husband would go in for the kill, but help would soon arrive from the most unexpected of places. As the cold, rotting hands of Parker Josh grip Renee's throat, she briefly sees the true appearance of the entity that is attacking her, the bride in black, grinning and laughing as he squeezes the life out of her. That is, until he is knocked in the head with a baseball bat by none other than Dalton Lambert. The boy that the bride had allowed to escape from the further a few days earlier was now proving to be quite a problem for him. This gives the family time to retreat into the basement. Not many people have basements in California. As Parker Josh goes all Jack Torrance trying to break into the basement and finish off the family, the real Josh is hard at work with Carl and Elise in the further trying to do his part. Elise suggests that the bride has a home in the further where all of his memories live, and their best shot is to use those memories to lure him out of Josh's body. They eventually find the dilapidated house where they witness the key memory that sent Parker down the path to becoming a monster. However, this time, Michelle turns and sees Elise and Carl. So it's up to Josh, real Josh, to dispel this evil woman from Parker's mind. He searches the room containing all of Parker's victims, but he's caught by surprise when he discovers Michelle hiding among them. She grabs him by the neck and slams him into the wall. Time is running out in the physical world. Parker Josh breaks into the basement. Renee is able to stall just a bit by beating him down with a pipe, and Specs wakes up and also unsuccessfully tries to slow him down. Meanwhile, Elise finds the young version of Parker in the further and asks him to open the door to his memories so that she can destroy the memories of Michelle, claiming that it'll set him free. It's fitting that all of this business with Josh and his family started because Parker just wanted to have himself a normal childhood, and it would be the child who granted access for Elise to do this. So exactly what happened here? It's actually left somewhat ambiguous. The first time I watched this movie, I didn't understand why destroying the ghost of Michelle would kick Parker out of Josh's body. How do you kill a ghost anyway? After thinking more about the ending, my interpretation is that this area of the further beyond the red door in Lorraine's basement purely contains Parker's memories, meaning that the incarnation of Michelle we see in there is just Parker's memory of her, different than the ghost of Michelle seen walking around the house. By destroying Parker's memory of his abusive mother, he no longer has any reason to exist as the bride in black, so he moves on. The trope for many ghost stories is that the ghosts stick around to haunt the real world because there's some unresolved issue. With Parker's scarring memories of his mom finally taken care of, he can finally move on to whatever lies beyond the further. Elise even alludes to the idea that the further is just somewhere you pass through on the way to a better place. We all pass through this place eventually, hopefully on our way to someplace better. I've seen that better place but I came back here because I heard you calling. Although in Parker's case, he's probably headed to the bad place. So essentially, Elise has finally defeated her longtime rival, even if she lost her life in the process. The character of Parker Crane exists as a maxim about child abuse. In real life, child abuse is especially harmful because as a child, the brain is still developing and growing. In the same way that it's easier to learn language that you were exposed to as a child, it's nearly impossible to erase the damage caused by maltreatment from a young age. This can affect behavior, emotional well-being, interpersonal relationships, and cognitive functioning. Once the brain is shaped by childhood experiences, these experiences will continue to affect a person into their adulthood. In this case, Parker was forced by his mom to act like a female and harm others, which gave way to his alter ego as the serial killer, the bride in black. In our world, the effects of child abuse may end at the end of a person's life, but in the world of Insidious, that continues onto the afterlife, where the bride continued his disturbing patterns, ultimately resulting in the loss of the franchise's greatest hero. If you want to learn more about the world of Insidious and the further, I highly recommend checking out that video on the left where I analyze the main antagonist, the red-faced demon. There is more Insidious and Conjuring content on the way, so remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.